Hello and welcome to another virtual program from Maine Historical Society. I'm Kathleen Newman. It's September 27th, 2020, and this is This Land Was Saved for You and Me, a book talk with Jeffrey Ryan. Jeffrey Ryan is passionate about the outdoors and the conservation of public land. His work has been cited in Forbes, USA Today, Appalachia, and in other notable publications. He is the author of Appalachian Odyssey, Blazing Ahead, and he's here with us tonight to talk about this, his latest book, This Land Was Saved for You and Me. He lives in Portland, Maine. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Thank you, Kathleen. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I love your group, and I've been uh, in many times, so this feels like home to me. That's great. Well, it's um, our, our pleasure to have you speaking with us tonight. Great. Well, without further ado, I will dive into my latest book, This Land Was Saved for You and Me. And I'll give you a quick little background, um, just uh, expanding a little bit on the intro that Kathleen gave me. Um, I really got into conservation through my activity in the outdoors. Um, it literally led me there. Um, in 1983, I hiked from Mexico to Canada when I was in my 20s, and here I am um, enjoying the view in the uh, East Cascades. And in um, following up that trip, I did a different approach, was, which was hiking the Appalachian Trail over uh, 28 years. I started in 1985 and finished in 2013. And as was mentioned, that led to two books, Appalachian Odyssey, about the 28-year hike, and then uh, when I was writing that book, I got really took a deep dive and a deep interest in how the Appalachian Trail was devised and built in the first place. So that led me to Blazing Ahead, a trail which literally brought two gentlemen together and ultimately pushed them apart, which I will touch on a little bit later in the presentation. And then after I wrote Blazing Ahead, I continued to sort of delve into the people that made the wilderness movement and conservation movement big strides in that area, particularly in the 1930s. So that led me to Rainy Lake, Minnesota, where I went to the house of a gentleman named Ernest Oberholzer, who was directly and a little bit indirectly responsible for 75 million acres of wilderness being protected up there. Um, it also led me to Aldo Leopold's shack where he did uh, much of his observation and a uh, landmark uh, prairie reserve, uh, preservation project on an old farm and ultimately led me to Milford, Pennsylvania and the first chief of the forest service, a fellow named Gifford Pinchot. So when I sort of pulled all this together, I had this great idea, I thought, of doing a conservation family tree and reaching back and finding all these movers and shakers who I continued to find were interconnected at an incredible level. And the more I dug, the more I found that it was getting harder and harder to sort of uh, disassemble the threads. It was uh, more than my pay grade. It was sort of like Spock doing three-dimensional chess as far as I was con concerned. So I decided to go back to a more linear approach to my storytelling in this case. And I came to the realization that there were over about 100, 110 years or so, three really quintessential and important baton passes in the conservation slash wilderness movement. The first was Frederick Law Olmsted, who passed the baton to Gifford Pinchot, and then Gifford Pinchot in turn passed the baton to a band of foresters whom he hired and would go on to implement the next phase of wilderness preservation. So I'm going to start with Olmsted, whom a lot of you are familiar with because his uh, fingerprints are all over Maine, <laughs> and uh, as well as thousands of other areas in America. The quintessential um, landscape designer, the founder of landscape design, um, 
for, for most people, they believe that um, there was another guy who uh, gets much less press, but um, Olmsted is the de facto only because partially because of his um, great influence on landscape design and man's um, connection with the places that he designed, the man and nature sort of push and pull. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, it is in fact Olmsted's 200th birthday this year, um, which has been celebrated far and wide. Over 6,000 projects were completed by the Olmsted design firm from 1857 to 1979, which is the breadth of the Olmsted firm. Um, there is a lot of confusion when people say Olmsted designed this park, that park, the, um, this uh, campus, whatever. Um, they are technically correct in most cases, but uh, which Olmsted? <laughs> um, his sons took over the firm in the late 1890s and um, held the reins. And then the Olmsted name stayed on the firm until, as I said, 1979. So it becomes a little, a little iffy when you're going in there and saying Olmsted designed. Olmsted, it's important to understand about Olmsted is he did not start out uh, in the profession, even heading toward the profession of landscape design. Um, he was a man of incredible varying talents and different interests, and they led him in so many directions that uh, it's obviously easy to remember him as the landscape designer, but it's also fascinating to dig into what happened before he got into that. He, in looking back on his life, later in life, he said, I think I was largely educated for my profession by the enjoyment which my father and stepmother um, gave to him. They led him on journeys throughout the greater Connecticut uh, countryside and so much more than that. Initially, it was his father that uh, would take he and his younger brother on such sojourns, mostly on foot. And that sort of went out into other directions. And in a lot of cases, young Olmsted was self-propelled. At the age of eight, he was already exploring within a 30 mile radius of his home in uh, Hartford. Hartford obviously was much more rural back then. There were many, many Olmsted family members in the vicinity and it they would actually set off on these walks uh, 15 miles, stay at one uh, relative's house and get up and walk another 15 miles the next day to get to the other, uh, the far distant one, and then the father would come and pick them up in a horse-drawn carriage. Um, Olmsted's, uh, he and his younger brother, John, their mother died um, about two years after John was born. So um, the, the stepmother, uh, was much more influential in joining the father and taking the kids out to see New England predominantly. So John and Marianne take the kids on these vacations. And again, this is all before the age of 12. Olmsted and family has already seen the Connecticut Valley, West Point, Niagara Falls, um, fittingly, um, which becomes a big theme uh, later on for him. And I thought this was great. He spelled uh, this this way, from the Kennebec to the Naugatuck. So far reaching as a young man um, in what he saw and what he observed, all, all fed into what he would ultimately become. Formal education, he basically didn't have any. Um, from ages three to 14, it was just a mishmash of experiences. His father farmed him out to be taught by a number of different uh, pastors mostly, and the experiences were um, a hodgepodge. Some of them were good educators, some of them weren't. Sometimes um, Frederick would complain, and his father would pull him out of that school and put him in another one. Um, one of the biographers, Elizabeth Stevenson, says that he's, he was almost treated like an orphan child. Um, 
his father wanted him to experience, have experiential education, but not, not really formal, which was uh, really interesting. The, the psychologists of uh, Olmsted believe it was because his father felt abandoned as a child and didn't really know how to uh, approach schooling his son, his oldest son. But his younger son, John, went on to become <laughs> formally educated. Um, at age 14, Frederick is preparing for Yale when he falls into a patch of poison sumac and has a violent uh, reaction to it, such that he's basically disabled for almost a year. So um, at age 15, he decides he doesn't want to go to Yale. He's going to try surveying. He moves in with another uh, pastor who has a sideline of surveying, learns what he can of that profession. At age 18, he decides, all right, maybe I'll try Yale again. He audits classes and he can't stand formal schooling. So he's back out again. At age 21, he says, I know I'll become a deckhand on a sailing ship for China. So he jumps on board a sailing ship, takes off for China, comes back after a year and says, you know what, I don't like that either. I want to become a fruit farmer. So his father, who was well-to-do, he was a, a very well-heeled merchant in uh, Hartford, bought, literally bought his son a farm, 100 acres of farmland, 25 acres of woodland, and Frederick starts putting his future profession to practice. He moves some outbuildings out of sight beyond a berm. Uh, he makes winding paths throughout. He does some planting, obviously fruit trees being one thing that he was trying to get off the ground. So he was trying to grow fruit commercially and uh, run a business in New York City selling fruit. But he gets derailed again. This time uh, in 1855, he decides he wants to be a writer. So he buys into Putnam's Monthly Magazine, um, whose basic competition then was Harper's Magazine. Um, he borrows 5,000 from his father to get that off the ground. And the farm, as part of the deal, goes to his brother, John. Um, he comes home. He's having signs of tuberculosis. He and his family move into the farm so that Flo, Frederick Law Olmsted, as I'll call him Flo most of the way through um, the presentation, can stay in New York and help run this magazine. The only thing is, his father says, this time the loan, the five grand needs to be repaid. So through a variety of circumstances, Putnam's goes belly up. The creditors say they need that Olmsted now owes $10,000 to Putnam's Magazine's creditors. And now he's in the hole 15 grand. And he's writing a book. Uh, he's sitting actually in a, uh, an inn in Connecticut when he gets the news that Putnam's has gone belly up and um, he later on finds out he owes all this money and he's thinking, what do I do now? And a friend of his walked into the inn and literally said, there's a superintendent of parks job coming um, that's open in New York City. Why don't you think about taking that? So that night he got on a ferry and went to New York City, I, and most of us know the rest of how that turned out. He not only became the superintendent of Central Park, but he partnered with a man named Calvert Vox, it is pronounced Vox, um, who had a cathedral building background in Europe. They knew each other before they had crossed paths and they teamed up to design, uh, submit a design for Central Park. The supervisors of the park, the board, had decided that they needed a more aspirational design than the one that, that was in place when Olmsted first came on board. And they invited submissions, and Olmsted and Vox submitted a plan that was absolutely uh, inspired. It was called the Greensward Plan. This is actually the cover of the plan for Central Park. Um, 
Vox handled all of the sort of man-made structures, the pavilions, the bridges, the boathouses, and Olmsted handled all the rest, the areas of aesthetic decision, as Vox said. What's really neat about that is obviously Olmsted had this um, pastoral view and also worldview because he had traveled all over um, the United States, including the Deep South. He'd been to China, as I mentioned before. He'd been uh, to Canada. He'd been to Niagara Falls. Um, and he was well-traveled. He, he got as far as Texas, actually. Um, so he, he had seen a lot. So Central Park was originally envisioned to be 750 acres. It expanded to over 840. Um, what's really amazing is we see Central Park, some of the drainage being constructed here in this picture. Um, as I mentioned, it began uh, construction in 1858 and the sheer volume of work that was done by hand um, is, is still a phenomenal achievement. 5 million cubic yards of stone, earth, and topsoil, 36 bridges and arches, of course, designed by Vox, overseen by Vox and Olmsted. Um, and they planted half a million trees. And as I said, everything built by hand. The fundamental goal of Central Park, as far as Olmsted was concerned, was the concept of bringing nature to the people. We had an urban environment that we, we desperately, he felt, we desperately needed to have nature available to people in an urban environment. And we can only imagine uh, New York's urban environment was scarcely what it is today, but he had the insight. His whole design was to emphasize nature and to minimize the man-made. So even though all those bridges and fountains and walkways and whatnot were traversing the park and features of the park. He designed the park so that there would be great open spaces that emphasize the natural landscape, the natural man-made landscape. Um, he incorporated hills. He did what was called haha -ha walls on a grand scale, which is putting uh, the roads that traverse Central Park or underground so it creates an optical illusion when you're looking across that it's one continuous landscape. Um, again, minimizing the man-made. And he said in, in the proposal, the freedom and repose, which will be refreshing and tranquilizing to the visitor coming from the confinement and bustle of the crowded streets. There needed to be a place for people in the urban environment to relax, to socialize, uh, to enjoy nature and all its splendor. So the two takeaways from this period of Olmsted were that large projects were not daunting to him at all. Um, taking on such a huge design project and running it um, were his primary obligations and avocations for at least a couple of years. Uh, one thing that happened was the comptroller started getting, uh, putting pressure on Olmsted to buy cheaper materials, to come into the office and justify purchases. And Olmsted didn't like that. And eventually it came to a head. Uh, he threatened to quit a couple of times. The commissioners brought him back, back into the fold, but finally he sought an out and got it. The second part of Central Park was, Olmsted was an amazing visionary. There are several cases in his writings and his life lessons where he looks at a situation and can see down the road, not only with his designs, he was clairvoyant almost in how he could picture trees 30 years down the road, filling in a landscape or which, which trees or shrubs to plant because they would fill in just so. But also culturally, he was a visionary. When they were designing Central Park, it was very um, swampy area. It was low slung buildings. Um, it was nowhere near what we, what we know New York is today for obvious reasons. 
But he looked around and he said to Vox, someday this park will be surrounded by tall buildings, which at the time in 1858 was utterly, I think, astounding. This is what it looks like now, obviously. So he was right on the money. So he leaves Central Park and he's looking for work because as we now, as we discussed, he owes his, his dad five grand and he owes the creditors 10 grand. And uh, if I'm remembering this correctly, his father paid the creditors for the magazine. So he basically owes his father $15,000 and he doesn't know where he's gonna get it. And he gets a telegram, telegraph message from a gold mine in California. And he, they ask him if he can run the gold mine and they offer him 10,000 a year to run it. So he goes out to run the Mariposa gold mine. And within uh, a few days of being there, he realizes that it's a mistake that um, the people who bought the mine, the people who hired him were, had been vastly uh, optimistic about how much gold was going to be able to be extracted. But Olmsted made a go of it and he worked himself to the bone and tried to figure out how to get this thing going and make enough money for the owners um, and also last through the year so that he could make his salary. Um, he can pay back his dad. Um, all of that came to fruition, but the gold mine went belly up within a year and a half of his arrival there. But shortly before it went belly up, he uh, went for the first time into the Mariposa uh, um, trees up in Yosemite Valley. And he was just transformed by what he saw up there. He immediately wrote back to his father that he had never seen anything as grand and beautiful as the giant sequoias in the Mariposa Valley. And it really had an effect on him. And as a result of that, he went back to the mine. He started thinking about how to extract himself from the mining obligation as things started going south. What was unbeknownst to him was uh, he wasn't the only one who had been taken by Yosemite Valley. Uh, there, were, there was a movement afoot to save the sequoias and in fact establish Yosemite as a state park initially, which it was, but they needed somebody to come up with a plan for the park. And that was Olmsted. They, they tapped him on the shoulder and he wrote a report about why Yosemite should be saved and how it should be managed. This was 1864, 1865, when he was doing this work. Not doing, not doing uh, urban park design, but doing a natural areas design. So he said, why we need scenery, we need to be able to contemplate scenery, which is playing off what he already knew and had um, basically proposed uh, when they did the uh, Central Park proposal. But now he's saying that it's also favorable to health and vigor, especially beyond conditions which can be offered them normally. So um, it gives people pleasure, not only for the time being, but increases the subsequent capacity for happiness and the means of securing happiness. So once we experience nature, experience the wild, we have the key to maintaining and securing happiness. Pretty big insight, 1864. And also he says, what happens if we don't have access to nature? Um, we, are, we are pressed by business and household cares and it results in a class of disorders, including mental disability, sometimes taking the severe forms of softening the brain, paralysis, palsy, monomania, or insanity, frequently of mental and nervous excitability, moroseness, melancholy, et cetera. So he's also identifying we need nature as a spiritual, emotional component of our lives. So now instead of uh, bringing nature to people, he's proposing bringing people to nature in this particular instance. So 
he's expanded his philosophy um, to fit the need, but he's also worried about the human impact on the park. Um, he's designing roads that go on the edges of the park, but do not go into the scenic places per se, they give overlooks of them. Um, another insight is that he would, he said that someday 3 million people will visit Yosemite to some of the people that he was on the commission with. Uh, for the record last year, it was 3.5 million. So again, Olmsted was way ahead of his time. He was envisioning heavy use and, and proposing what to do about it. So the bummer about the Mariposa report is that it was largely ignored. In fact, it was totally ignored. Two of the people on the commission with him were also involved with other California state projects that they were afraid if Olmsted and their group got the $35,000 that they wanted to build out the park, that their pet projects would get abandoned. So they undermined the Mariposa report and it went into a drawer for several decades. Um, when his son found it in the early uh, 1900s, he actually used some of the language that Olmsted had used to create the mission statement for the National Park Service in 1916. So after Mariposa, Olmsted's adrift again, um, go figure. He has a history of sort of bopping around from one job to another. He's, he's been going through periods of severe melancholy uh, depression. Um, this has been happening since some of the Central Park days, but it really kicked in um, when he was running the mine. A lot of times he was alone out there before his family came out and he was under enormous pressure. Um, he's really not sure he wants to design parks anymore. He actually thinks about investing in oil and starting a company with his wife. Um, and he takes for just holding pattern to have some money coming in. He designs Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland, California. And all during this time, he's being uh, peppered with, I guess you'd say, letters from Vox saying, please, please, please come back and join me. I have a lot of projects going. I think it will reinvigorate you and get our firm off and running again. Um, and at the time, Olmsted writes to his father and says, all my life I've been considering distant effects and always sacrificing immediate success and applause to that of the future. Um, very consistent, very on the money, um, great insight for self insight for him to have. Um, what, what will the applause of the future be for him? He finally ultimately decides that what he needs to do is get working with Vox again. Vox says, I have it, Eureka. I have this huge project called Prospect Park in New York City and please come on and help run it with me. And that begins the partnership again, which lasts, um, formally for seven years, but informally, they, their friendship and um, consulting one another lasts for another 30 until Vox dies in 1895. So now we have an, some insight into Olmsted and what he had been doing, and we're ready to go with the baton pass from him to Frederick Law, uh, to, I'm sorry, to Gifford Pinchot. So how did that happen? To really understand that whole piece of it, we have to go back to James Pinchot, who was Gifford Pinchot's father. Um, the Pinchot family, James's father, moved to Milford, Pennsylvania in 1819, and his father, um, James Pinchot's father, had purchased 400 acres of woodland there. He promptly clear-cut it all to make money off of the timber, and that made the family fairly well to do. They operated a store, but the land speculation and lumbering was what brought them prominence. Um, they were upper middle class, but James really found an uber fortune far away from home. He didn't like 
the lumber business. He didn't really deeply know why, but he just knew he didn't want to run the family business. So he went to New York City. And what he found there was a fortune in making wallpaper and uh, having wallpaper imported from France largely and um, window treatments. So from 1850 to 60 in New York, the population skyrocketed as is shown here. And of particular uh, interest to James was the fact that hotels were on the rise in New York City. There were massive hotels being built to accommodate visitors and um, uh, locals alike to, um, to visit New York. So, uh, you know, coming in from suburbs to do business and whatnot, or, or even a little bit further afield, New York was a big draw. So long story short, huge opportunity for window treatments and wallpaper. And James became a multimillionaire. He made $4 million, um, which was an enormous sum for the 1860s. Um, he was socially connected and socially focused. Um, because his family came from France, he was morally and financially invested in bringing the Statue of Liberty to America. He meets Richard Morris Hunt of Brattleboro, Vermont, who was the architect of the Statue of Liberty pedestal. And um, here's the design of the pedestal taking shape. Um, Pinchot's father, James, helped come up with the money for that project and many more. So he establishes this relationship with Richard Morris Hunt, who he decides he should hire to uh, design the family residence. So here's the family residence in Milford, Pennsylvania, which I was just at last weekend. Um, doing a presentation. It's just a phenomenal castle. Um, everyone should go there <laughs> unequivocally. It's owned by the, the um, U.S. Forest Service now. It's where Gifford Pinchot grew up. And it was um, James and his wife's summer and family's summer home and retirement project. He retired at age 44, and they began construction of the castle of Gray Towers in 1866. You will notice the two turrets. There are actually three of them. Um, he, they did not want to disparage the Lafayette family by putting four turrets on, so they only put three. There's a bust of Lafayette on the front, uh, inlaid into the front of the, of the Gray Towers um, facade overlooking the mountains around uh, Milford. So James and Mary Jane Eno Pinchot, who was Mary Jane, also came from a family of wealth, much more than James had, as a matter of fact. Um, they correspond with Frederick Law Olmsted to build the grounds um, around Gray Towers. So this is the first interconnection of Olmsted with the Pinchot family. They ran in similar circles at least uh, philosophically, or uh, Olmsted knew where to get work. So at the time, Gifford, young Gifford was one year old when they first were constructing Gray Towers. Um, James, as I said, retired and sets his sights on making a difference for America. That's what he wants to do with his life. And he's certainly in position to help make that so. At the time when they were building Gray Towers, we're looking at a period of, in America where uh, resources felt were felt to be inexhaustible. Um, and so this is what the virgin forests in America looked like when the pilgrims arrived in 1620. This is what it looked like um, near the turn of the century. We see the forests getting uh, mostly clear cut and then by the early 1900s, um, in 1910s, 19 teens, 1920s, this is what we're seeing. So virgin forests had been largely clear cut and lo and behold, James realizes that he's part of the problem. His family uh, clear cut 400 acres themselves. So James reads a very influential book in his life and what, which will be uh, influential in his son's life too, by extension, a book by a guy from Vermont named George Perkins Marsh. It's called Man and Nature. 
And Mar Marsh wrote this book in 1864. He was already uh, very aware of man's influence on the landscape. Um, we have already felled too many trees. We need to restore the, the forest and bring nature and trees back to their normal proportion, proportions and design a means of maintaining the land. Um, everything depends on the health of the forest in terms of um, water, water flow, water quality. We're just doing it all wrong. And James read this book and was blown away. Um, he wasn't the only one. Many people were influenced to this, by this book, which is are largely not remembered today, um, arguably should be. Um, and he was from uh, Woodstock, Vermont area. There's uh, now an estate over there that has been preserved and it's um, a wonderful place to visit. So one of the things that Marsh said was the improvement of the trees is work of centuries. So much more the reason for beginning now. It takes centuries to rebuild forests. Let's get busy. And James reads this, and of course, he's aware of not only forests being wiped out, but, you know, the bison have taken a huge hit, the birds have taken a huge hit, um, and his family was personally responsible for landscapes such as this. So what can he do about it? Well, he decides that he's going to help his son, his oldest son, Gifford, chart his course. He gives him a copy of Man and Nature and uh, along with Mary and his first 21st birthday and says, here's one example of you know, how they are helping this young man decide to take on forestry as his career. And in fact, one day James says to his son, uh, before he goes off to Yale, how would you like to be a forester? And later on, Pincho would say, just how amazing a question it was he didn't really understand until much later, but he was already on the path. Um, he got to Yale. He tells his cohorts that forestry is going to become his life work. They don't know what forestry is. Um, there's Gifford there. And in fact, he's assured by a professor that there isn't even any school in the country that's teaching forestry. There is no such profession. And instead of getting upset at that, Gifford's response is, great, I, I will not only have no competitors, but I will be able to get a science off the ground, even a science to found. So after he gets out of Yale, he goes off in search of a forestry school. His father and mother help get him to France where he studies for uh, just under 18 months. He does a lot of field work and some class work in the winter. And he learns about sustainable forestry for the first time, the selective harvesting and succession planting ideas that the French were and Germans were already teaching. So he comes back, he's got a real uh, fuse lit under him to get this profession going before someone else does. He's, he's under, the, under the gun, his, his, <laughs> he's, he's holding his own gun to his head saying, if I don't do this, someone's gonna beat me to it. But the fact of the matter is he comes back to the United States and he doesn't have any place to work because no one understands the importance of forestry other than his parents and he. So America isn't ready to take on his vision of forestry. He goes to Washington DC. He goes around the Capitol building. He tries to meet people um, introduced through his parents largely. Um, it's not really working too much. Um, he gets a couple of jobs with Phelps and Dodge uh, Mining Company to do some field work, but it's not paying the bills. He writes some articles about the need to uh, manage forests and he bides his time. So meanwhile, he's on this career track that doesn't really have a track yet. Meanwhile, in 1888, the Biltmore Forest Frederick Law Olmsted is summoned by George Vanderbilt to come to Asheville, North Carolina. And he says to Olmsted, I've secretly been buying up a bunch of land here 
It's largely been clear cut. So I've been buying it on the cheap. And uh, I want to build a castle of my own here, um, which will become the largest privately held residence in the history of the United States. Um, so Olmsted looks around and sees all of this clear cut forest and says, hmm, I think uh, James Pinchot's son is doing something in that regard. I think I'm going to hire him. So there's over 86,000 acres of forest to be managed. And Olmsted has the grounds to design all these fountains and gardens and walkways and all of that. And um, he turns over the 86,000 acres to Pinchot, young Gifford. So now he has a profession to found and a place to do it, a huge place to do it. His mission as he saw it was to prove the viability of managed forests. As I said before, the, the, the business model for forestry as, as it existed was to cut as far as the eye could see. Um, in some cases, it was cut and run forestry. The clear cutting would just happen and the tax, uh, taxes would be unpaid in the wake of those uh, clear cuts. In the case of the Adirondack, severe damage was done and everyone bolted. Um, almost everyone left the Adirondacks barren and moved on, kept going west and moving on. And Pinchot was, was hell bent to show them that there was a better way to uh, run forestry, to build forestry. So the first things, as he saw it, were building credibility and, and, and connecting and getting the word out. Pinchot was a master at that. He was uh, a master at doing two things, getting the word out and, and um, proving the viability, building the political will. So the first things he were, was doing was writing articles for the, the most read horticultural magazine of its time, Garden and Forest Magazine. Um, he really felt that he needed the average American to understand what was at stake. We could not have status quo. It just wasn't going to work. We were going to cut all the trees all the way to the Pacific Ocean and not have a succession plan for um, for uh, uh, building America, basically, or the future. And he also was very careful and, and consistent in his message that he wasn't against forestry. It wasn't about stopping forestry. It was about regulating it. And he was so good at getting the word out that, in fact, the collection of Pinchot material is the largest personal collection of correspondence in the Library of Congress. He was absolutely relentless at writing letters, telegrams, uh, whatever needed to be done, articles, press releases, et cetera. He was great politically, as I mentioned, forging alliances, particularly TR was his hero and friend. Um, that began when TR Roosevelt was governor of New York. Pinchot was already telling him that he felt that the forests of New York were being mismanaged and he had a better idea. Some of those ideas were implemented at when TR was governor. And of course, uh, when Roosevelt becomes vice president in 1900, um, he begins making speeches largely written by Pinchot about the importance of national forests. We need national forests. And their relationship matured all the way through TR's presidency um, and beyond. Pinchot's driving principle was the greatest good for the greatest number of people over the long haul. That's how he thought that all forests should be managed. Um, he had an inexhaustible drive to make the forests a reality, national forests. In the meantime, he was working on commissions and making recommendations to make that happen. He traveled the country by horseback and by train. He went all the way to the West Coast. He met John Muir. He went on two trips with Muir over his lifetime. He got to know all sides of preservation and conservation, the pros and cons. And then finally in 1898, he was named the chief of the forestry division. 
the only problem with that was he was he was uh, in charge of coming up with recommendations, but he was not in charge of the forests themselves. The forests themselves were within the part Department of Interior, and Pinchot was working in agriculture, Department of Agriculture. And even at the time, there was a move afoot to pull the rug out from under him. Um, the Department of Interior, as I said, controlled all the existing forests and the forestry division could only come up with recommendations. And added on to all of this, Congress was demanding that the, chief, the forestry division prove their worth. What are they doing? What, what are they doing uh, in the name of the federal government or what value are they adding? This is when uh, Pinchot's just brilliance comes shining through. So he says, all right, if, I can, if we can't become indispensable to the government, to the land, the government owned land, let's become indispensable to private landowners. So he publishes a circular to help farmers and pro other private landowners make working plans for, develop, for managing their forests. And in the first year, he has uh, an enormous uh, number of people taking advantage of that. In 1904, he says, I'm done with this having uh, the title and no influence. So he designs a conference uh, specifically for the move to get people yelling or, or moving in the direction of getting forest reserves under Gifford, Gifford Pinchot's um, um, leadership. So he invites uh, various groups representing all sides of the issue and it was an enormous success. Uh, he won almost everyone over to their side and it took 26 days after the conference for Roosevelt and Congress to transfer the forests over to Pinchot's domain. Imme immediately after that, 86 million acres come under his control. So now he needs to hire foresters and uh, he goes, sets about doing that, hiring foresters and giving them the tools to do the job. He publishes over six months with some of his early hires, something called the use book, which was a way to standardize policy and giving them the guidance to run the agency in the wild. It developed an incredible sense of loyalty among the people who came to work with him. Um, they were fired with the determination to do the utmost to do what needed to be done. These were largely young men and women, recent college graduates that were put out in the Western states to tell uh, people that there was a new way of running the forest which you can only imagine how much pressure was on these kids. Um, and one of them said, anything Pincho said was right, we would follow him through fire and flood. Um, he also had to win over uh, Western, uh, mostly timber harvesters. And that was really difficult. He was introduced at one public lands convention in Denver as the meanest individual on earth. And what he did was he walked into the lion's den and said, if you fellows can stand me, I can stand you. Let's figure out how to get along. And one newspaper account said, um, it, he assured them that everyone would get equal treatment and that um, great results would come out of their working together, including the protection of, of their forests so that it, everything would be done fairly. Um, and it would also ensure the availability of water for irrigation. When Pinchot finished his speech, he had turned them around. And um, one of the reporters on site said he was cheered lustfully, which I think was really neat. So now for Baton Pass number two, as I mentioned, um, Pinchot hired a number of young foresters, hundreds of them, as a matter of fact, um, over 200 of them, and set them um, to work managing the forests. Also, um, managing sustainability and uh, lab studies on growing trees. It wasn't all field work. So at about this time, some of his uh, foresters were beginning to sort of see an opportunity for a third leg of the stool, actually a fourth leg of a chair. Um, the first one was 
public lands, uh, public parks in the model of Olmsted. The second was national forests in the, in the spirit of Pinchot. The third was national parks, which was serving a different audience and a different mandate, 1916, if you'll recall. So now some of his young foresters are seeing um, something happening that's really troubling to them. And that is the incursion of automobiles. Um, onto public lands. Benton Mackay, who came up with the idea of the Appalachian Trail and was also one of the young foresters molded and hired by Pinchot, is beginning to realize that we need a refuge from civilization, um, that cars are really starting to infiltrate the national parks, the national forests, and there, the um, threat was real. If we see um, the number of cars that are being adopted in the US from 1900 to uh, 1970, but in the period we're talking in the 1930s, we're going up to uh, almost 50% ownership in uh, a 30, 40 year period. Um, it's having a huge effect on the land, particularly on places like um, Shenandoah where Skyline Drives were being built and there were, um, there were um, proposals for 12 more skyline drives nationwide. So a bunch of foresters, including Benton Mackay, were going to an American Forestry Association meeting in 1934. Uh, Harvey Broom, who was not a forester, but was a uh, advocate for the Smokies. Bernard Frank, who was a forester, and Bob Marshall, who many of you know, from the Bob Marshall Wilderness fame and was a forester, got together and said, we have to do something about this incursion of automobiles. They were ironically in a car being driven by Harvey Broom's wife, Miriam, and they got so animated about what they needed to do that they got out of the car and scrambled up an embankment and decided that they needed, as, as Mackay said, to start a organization that was against Skyline Drives. And Bob Marshall said, we shouldn't start an organization which is against anything. We should start an organization that is for something. So they decided that they would do that. And the original eight members of this society included Aldo Leopold, who many of you know from a Sand County Almanac, Bob Marshall, as I mentioned, Benton Mackay, the father of the Appalachian Trail, and they formed the Wilderness Society. Um, after two decades of fits and starts, the, the uh, Wilderness Society has uh, a number of things confronting them. Two of the founders, Bob Marshall, dies at age 38. Robert Sterling Yard dies well into his 80s. So uh, only six of the founders are left. Most of them are in other projects. And 66-year-old Mackay becomes president. He realizes he's not the one to drive the mission forward. Um, so he hires a gifted communicator named uh, Howard Zahnizer, who they initially thought, boy, is this guy the right choice? And um, in spades, he was. Um, in 47, Mackay says, we need to secure a nationwide system of wilderness areas protected by statutory law. And Zahnizer spends the next 17 years bringing that to fruition. Um, I will just say Howard Zahnizer is a hugely unsung hero uh, in American conservation history. If you wanna learn more about him, um, I have a film about him that I, I made on voicesofthewilderness.com. Zahnizer did not see opponents as enemies similar to Pinchot, he really wanted understanding and um, preached patience um, and went through what he needed to do to get the Wilderness Act passed. Um, he was intensely collaborative. He just kept meeting with people and saying that he believed that wilderness would not be firmly established and ensured until all sides of the issue were represented so that people would not start trying to undo what was done collaboratively. There was a need for wilderness. Um, it, it's our faith that a vibrant, vital culture and an enduring civilization 
of healthful, happy people who perpetually renew themselves in contact with the earth. That's what we need wilderness for. Um, ironically, in May of 64, Zahnheiser died in his sleep, but he died knowing that the bill was headed toward passage. In, in July of that year, the full house voted with only one dissenting vote, and it was signed into law by LBJ in 64. Initially, 9.1 million acres were saved, including the ones you see here. And then today, it has now come to comprise nearly 112 million acres of lands with that already, in, in many cases, were already within our national parks, national forests. In other cases, they were um, they were decreed and developed on on um, as separate entities. So just really quickly to wrap it up, there is a strong connection with Maine with all of these initiatives. Olmsted himself was involved in Back Cove and Cushing Island and many other private estates and some parks. Um, the overlap is that his son, Frederick Law Olmsted Jr. was involved in many of the things that we're familiar with, Deering Oaks, Eastern Prom, Western Prom, Acadia National Park, Camden Village Green, many more over 6,000 projects in all. And yes, I have the book <laughs> of all of them. I don't know if you can see that. It's probably not in focus. Um, pretty phenomenal. Um, one thing I did wanna point out was their sense of design sensibility. This is a drawing of Acadia carriage path or carriage road that I saw at Olmsted's uh, office when I was down there touring earlier this spring. And notice how the sight lines from the automobile, make it so that the passenger can look down and see into the brook as they're passing by, just the uh, incredible level of detail that Olmsted and partners established. Uh, as far as national forests, we all, most of us know, the White Mountain National Forest spills into Maine um, on the, on the uh, western edge. And um, Benton Mackay was actually responsible for doing the report that led to the creation of White Mountain National Forest, which is a whole other story, but a pretty phenomenal tie-in with that. And uh, yes, we have national wilderness areas in Maine. The newest one is Caribou Speckled Mountain uh, on the Western Edge, uh, 1970, I believe, and uh, Moosehorn Wilderness Area um, up, up on the Eastern Edge, uh, way down East which I've also been to. I think I said 1970 for Caribou Speckled. I think it's 1990. So anyway, much of what I've been talking about and, and much more are covered in my book, This Land Was Saved for You and Me, which is available um, in, in many places in Portland area in particular, um, the favorite bookstores that we have in town. Um, it covers Olmsted, Pinchot, the Baton Passes, the creation of our parks, the question of preservation and conservation and the political and economic realities of creating all of these lands. What were, what were these groups and individuals up against? And uh, also, as I mentioned, you can go to my website, Jeff Ryan Author, and see where it's available. Um, if you're not in the Portland area, many other places to buy local bookstores world, uh, worldwide, <laughs> nationwide, and uh, others. And I just really want to thank the uh, Maine Historical Society, who's also celebrating a 200th anniversary That's this right. year. <laughs> so I think we did it. We packed a lot in there. And uh, thank you so much for having me. Oh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, really interesting. Lots of great information. You can buy the book through uh, Maine Historical Society's museum store. I put Bravo. that link. I put that link in the chat, and um, it's uh, our website for the store is mainhistorystore.com. Or, of course, you can visit us in person at 489 Congress Street. Uh, we're open Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to 5. Um, and I put your uh, the link to your website in the chat to Jeff, um, Jeff Ryan author.com. Can you tell me a little bit about where did you do some of the research for this book and where could where some other places folks could go to learn more about whether it's Olmsted or, or Pinchot or, or just this topic in general? Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> I, I, 
I uh, I went to Burlington, Iowa, to see where where um, where Leopold grew up. Um, it just so happened when I pulled in there, they said, "Oh my gosh, we're having a a state conservation uh, group meeting tomorrow. Why don't you come and meet with us and get a tour?" So that was pretty fun. Um, I also obviously went to a shack in Wisconsin. Wonderful, wonderful. The um, the um, Gifford Pinchot Foundation, or the, uh, I keep saying Pinchot, the Aldo Leopold Foundation is wonderful up there. I went to Rainy Lake in Minnesota twice uh, to see um, the uh, Ernest Oberholzer Island that he lived in up there where he saved the 75 million acres. Uh, Olmsted's office in Brookline is a must, house and office is a must, must see. Um, it's just phenomenal. They have all the drawings uh, that they did over all those years are in there. They're archived. But just seeing where they worked and how they laid out the office area was great. And, and um, you know, on and on and on it goes. Um, Milford, Pennsylvania is an absolute must visit. Um, as I said, I've been there many, many times. Um, the, the grounds themselves are breathtaking any time of year. Um, and it's right at the head of Delaware Water Gap. So you can also drive down through about a 30 mile stretch of uh, protected uh, roadway on either side, uh, Delaware River on one side and cliffs on the other. It's, it's pretty beautiful down there. Nice. You mentioned, um, you know, some places in Maine, where we can see, you know, Olmsted's influence. Do you have a particular favorite, you know, for folks that are in Maine? Where could they go to see something that was, you know, designed by Olmsted or that has his influence, his fingerprints all over? What's your What's your favorite spot? Oh boy, that's so tough. <laughs> I, I uh, I'm so lucky. I, I walk the Eastern Prom almost every day, and mm -hmm. I go to the Western Prom, uh, you know, once a week. Um, you know, in Deering Oaks, I mean, all of it's wonderful in Portland. Um, outside of Portland, the, the Camden Village Green is designed by him. And you can see, um, you know, uh, designed by his son. You can see so many uh, of the influences and, and they share such a common vision. I, I need to add that Olmsted Sr. was adamant about having his, his son, um, Flo Jr., go to Europe and see the exact same parks that Olmsted saw mm -hmm. as a young man um, and report back to him why they made decisions they made. So he wanted his son to observe and feel the same things that he did so that they, they would have the same design sensibility, mm -hmm. which I thought was really fascinating. But, you know, um, a lot of people don't know that the Orono campus was designed by Flo Sr., um, he designed many uh, hospital buildings. Um, just um, there's a there's a um, there's a list online. I wish I had the the. If you Google it, you'll find it. But there's a repository of all of the projects, and you can look them up by state, um, which is just a great resource. Nice, nice. One of the ironies of uh, Olmsted Senior's life was that he died in a sanitarium that had grounds designed by him um, in, in Massachusetts. Um, and as the story goes, he, he was suffering from dementia. And as the story goes, when his wife was, was leading him in there, he had a moment of clairvoyance when he, when he, when he looked around, he had a, a moment of lucidity where he returned to his wife and said, they didn't do it right. <laughs> so, so that was uh, kind of interesting right up until the end. He, he carried his design sensibility on some level. Wow. Now, I, again, I've shared your website for folks that are interested, um, jeffryanauthor.com, but can you tell us just, you know, what's, what's next for you in your work? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm actually, I've done two film documentaries. They're really long in the making. Um, they, they take an awful long time, longer than I hope uh, or dream. <laughs> but um, I've done one of Leopold and I've one, um, done one of Howard Zahnizer. Fortunately, got to interview his son at length oh, wow. in a, in a uh, film studio on, um, at the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Headquarters in Virginia. 
and it's it's wonderful. Howard Zonizer, one of the most beautiful people, and um, and just the legacy that that he created uh, under his own steam is pretty incredible. And I'm working on another one about Ernest Oberholzer, which is why I, I was in Minnesota several times. So I've got I've got the, most of the raw material. I need to get on that, and uh, I'm working on another project book project about a guy from um, Monson, Maine, who went to China in 1934 and climbed a mountain that was purported to be higher than Everest. And um, that that one's leading me in a lot of interesting directions. I can imagine. <laughs> so keep an eye out for that. We will for sure. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Jeff. Thank uh, you. This, this was great. And um, yeah, please, please stay in touch. Let us know what you're working on. And I and, hope... Um, uh, Go ahead. One quick thing. I really want to thank you for carrying the book in the store. I, I did not know you were doing that. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So that was a lovely absolutely. surprise. Thank yes. you. Yep. You can get it at MHS. And um, I hope uh, folks that will see you back here for another program soon or uh, in person in Portland soon. Thanks very much.